When the Nazis lost the Second World War, Germany wasn't just conquered. It literally ceased to exist as a state. The territory was divided up between the victorious powers, with the democratic, capitalist allies taking control of the west of the country, and the autocratic, communist eastern bloc taking control of the east. Soon, both sides had established a new German state of their own, rebuilding Germany along their respective ideological lines. Today, we'll be talking about the East German state, the German Democratic Republic, or as it's more commonly known, East Germany. It was the second power of the Warsaw Pact, and the dramatic changes it brought to German society can still be felt to this day. The Soviet Union occupied what would become East Germany in the aftermath of the Second World War, while the Allies occupied the zones in the West, in what would become West Germany. Berlin was also divided into a western and eastern section, with the western half becoming a small island deep in Soviet territory. This division was intended to be temporary, with there being an expectation in the Soviet Union that Germany could become a demilitarized, neutral buffer state between the two blocs. Practical circumstances, however, prevented this. Berlin, and Germany as a whole, was in rubble. In the centre of Berlin, in the days following the conflict, there was no shelter, food or electricity. One journalist, Ruth Andreas Friedrich, survived the Battle of Berlin by hiding in a basement while the city was torn down around her. In the following days, starvation set in until an ox happened to wander into sight through the rubble. She and three other survivors succeeded in capturing the animal and leading it into the backyard of the house they had sheltered in. They wanted to eat it, but they were lifelong city dwellers. A passing Soviet soldier took pity on them and shot the animal. There in the backyard, they cut up the body and began to eat, but they weren't alone for long. They crept from a hundred basements, women, men, children, where they lured by the smell of blood, and within minutes everyone was tussling for the scraps of meat. So this is what the hour of liberation looks like, the moment we have spent twelve years waiting for. This was the state of Germany in 1945, and the conditions the Allies would have to rebuild from. The method for doing so varied depending on the zone. The western sections focused on the immediate rebuilding of Germany, with American aid under the Marshall Plan. The Soviets, meanwhile, focused more on extracting reparations in the form of industrial goods. During the occupation, the Soviets levied reparations but also physically stripped the territory. Operation Ossovikim began on the 21st of October 1946 and deported thousands of skilled workers to the USSR along with their equipment. Factories all across the country had their equipment sent to the USSR as repayment for the invasion. Things got so bad that railways on virtually all sections, every second set of lines was torn up and taken for transport to the Soviet Union. Most of the remaining industries were nationalized, and the shock was made worse by the mass exodus of refugees to the western zones. The Soviet Union was seeking $20 billion worth of reparations and had no way to obtain it other than stripping Germany. This sort of approach immediately created a divide between the East and West. As the West rebuilt, the East continued to suffer for years. The plan, though, was still to eventually restore Germany to a mostly self-sufficient state, and that meant finding people who could lead the country. Naturally, the Soviets favored German communists. Finding local Germans to take the reins was difficult, though. Most senior positions in Soviet territory were reserved for members of the Olbricht Group, a group of German communists that had lived in exile in the Soviet Union for decades, led by Walter Olbricht. It also included those freed from the camps. These Germans established a unified communist front with the leftist parties that reformed in Germany. Under Soviet watch, these organizations were given administrative posts in transport, energy, trade, industry, land, forestry, finance, labor, education, justice, and health. Communists held all important positions in these shadow ministries, and these groups eventually formed the basis of the East German government. In 1948, tensions between the Western Allies and Soviet Union was growing. The goodwill from the Second World War had masked the worst of these issues for a few years, but the differences between the two sides were too much. The Western powers introduced a new currency to their zone, including in West Berlin, pointedly excluding the Eastern occupation zone. It became clear in this moment that reunification wasn't going to occur. The Soviet Union attempted a blockade of West Berlin to force the Allies to use Soviet currency, which failed after Allied airlifts supplied the city. This is generally seen as the beginning of the Cold War. Shortly afterwards, in 1949, the Western Zones joined together into the Federal Republic of Germany. In response, the Soviets gave independence to their own occupation zone in October 1949, calling it the German Democratic Republic, or most commonly, East Germany. At first, as much as a quarter of the population were German refugees fleeing the eastern territories given to Poland. Over the course of its existence, East Germany experienced a massive population decline. In 1950, it boasted a population of over 18 million people, while West Germany contained the bulk of the German population with over 50 million. However, by 1990, East Germany had lost more than 2 million of its citizens, who had mostly fled to the west. 
while West Germany had increased its population by more than 12 million over the same time period. This was in spite of the East German government's concerted efforts to encourage children. There were very few political advantages that the East Germans had over the West, but one of them was the capital. Berlin, despite being a split city, was still made the capital of the GDR, while the West was governed from Bonn. This seemingly small detail added some frankly much-needed legitimacy to the East Germans, which had always struggled with popular support. You see, East Germany was a one-party dictatorship from the very beginning, and in terms of leadership it's actually very easy to talk about. East German politics is basically the story of two men, Walter Ulbricht and Erich Honecker. These two men served one after the other as head of the Socialist Unity Party from 1950 all the way to 1989, covering the entire important history of the GDR. I'll go into more detail about how it all worked because communist states like to make things as convoluted as possible. I can only assume this was to baffle opposition into submission. Okay, so a quick overview of the political structure. When East Germany was founded, there were two houses of parliament, similar to other parliamentary structures. The lower house, or people's chamber, and the upper house, or state's chamber. The lower house was made up of officials elected, kind of, for five-year terms. All members of the house were part of a group of accepted political parties that all existed under the banner of the governing coalition of the National Front. The largest of these parties was the Socialist Unity Party of Germany, that in reality ran the entire country and controlled the entire National Front. All other political parties were subservient and only existed to give the appearance of consensus. During elections, the government distributed ballots with the candidates already written in, in order of preference. Most people simply took the ballot and then put it in the ballot box unchanged. There were voting booths available in which a voter could strike a name off the ballot if they wanted, thereby giving someone further down on the list to vote, but elections were monitored by the secret police and doing so was dangerous. Additionally, if a person didn't want any of the candidates, they could take a blank ballot and fill in a new name. However, this was done in public and most certainly would have gotten someone arrested. So East Germany technically had an elected government. Technically being the operative word there. Prior to 1952, the GDR was divided into states, with local governments that sent representatives to the state's chamber. However, the states were abolished in 1952 and that chamber was dissolved, leaving only the People's Chamber as the parliament until East Germany's dissolution. That was all fairly brief, and you might be thinking, surely you can't summarize 40 years of political history like that. But actually I can, because all of that structure is completely unimportant. Neither chamber had any actual authority or independence, and served only as a rubber stamp to decisions made by the actual centre of power. The Socialist Unity Party of Germany. The most important heads of the SED were Walter Ulbricht, who headed it from 1950 to 71, and then Honecker, from 71 to 89. Albrecht was an old communist, studying in Russia and going back to the Weimar days of Germany. He'd fled to Russia during the time of the Nazis and returned to the Soviet occupation forces. He was a committed Stalinist who focused pretty exclusively on heavy industry. He built the party as the sole source of power in the country and did his very best to separate the country from the West, including building the Berlin Wall. Yes, the Berlin Wall was a German action rather than a Soviet one. Albrecht declared in a press conference in June 1961 that nobody had any intention of building a wall before he immediately started building the wall. He replaced the East German constitution with a more communist one in 1968 and was in power until 71 when Honecker took over due to his unpopularity. Albrecht was the father of East Germany but his legacy wasn't all that great even within the country itself and today he's basically disliked wherever he isn't forgotten. He was a very red terror kind of communist and that just wasn't all that popular by the end of his time in power. It simply seemed outdated. This was a man that knew Lenin personally, except that it was the 1970s and that really just made him seem old. And he publicly made fun of the Beatles, which I admit probably didn't kill his career, but certainly didn't help his image of being old and out of touch. Honecker eventually deposed Albrecht in 1971 and focused the East German economy more on, on consumer goods to help alleviate some of the unrest. However, if you thought he would bring about political reform, you would be wrong. Honecker was every bit as hardline as Ulbricht had been, just more practical. He understood that people needed to, you know, have stuff if they were going to support him. Honecker had actually been one of the main architects of the Berlin Wall, and during his time in power he refused to budge from keeping the border closed. In later years he conflicted heavily with Gorbachev, and the two disliked one another. Honecker saw Gorbachev as a fool undermining the USSR with reforms, while Gorbachev thought of Honecker as a bullheaded hardliner incapable of seeing the reality of the situation. Things got so bad that by the end of the 1980s, East Germany was actually censoring some Soviet media for not being communist enough. Honecker finally fell from power in 1989, only a few weeks before the Berlin Wall fell. The last head of East Germany that you might call dictator was Egon Krenz, 
who served for around a month before the state collapsed around him, despite his vigorous and ongoing attempts to maintain communist rule. Mr. Krenz is still alive, believe it or not, and I'm currently searching for his contact information to see if I can ask him a few questions. I can't promise anything, obviously. In fact, I'd be amazed if he responded, but who knows? Maybe it will be a later video. From the end of the Second World War to the 1990s, Berlin was a divided city. The western half was a small island of the capitalist west, surrounded on all sides by East Germany and penned in by a wall. While the east was a heavily militarized capital city, waiting to become whole again. For the first years of the division, travel between the two sides of Berlin was possible. Citizens of Berlin could live in one half and work in the other, or visit family and friends in the other side of the city. In 1961, this changed when the East German authorities built an actual dividing wall along the East German border. Though it was initially a small barrier of barbed wire, it soon sprang into a vast network of concrete walls guarded by soldiers from watchtowers and border crossings. Almost overnight, West Berlin had become an island, and the city was split down the middle. The Berlin Wall was by far the most famous sector of the inner German border, but it was far from the only fortified section. The entire border between East and West Germany was a militarized zone. Millions of soldiers stood guarding it, waiting for an enemy attack or to prevent citizens from escaping west. In places that escape would be easy, there were more concrete walls. East Germany had effectively cut itself off from the Western world and made the Iron Curtain slightly more literal than it had been intended. It was highly effective at separating the country and helped cement the power of the East German government, but it also made relations between the two sides incredibly strained. It was difficult for the world not to see the East Germans as the baddies when they had built a wall around their country with armed guards for the purpose of keeping their own people in. It's hard not to make the prison comparison. The Berlin Wall provided the forum for some of the most famous moments of the Cold War as well, and when the Berlin Wall fell in 1989, it was widely seen as the failure of communism as a whole. One of the cornerstones of the East German state was the Ministry of State Security, or as they're more commonly known, the Stasi. This ministry was in all likelihood the most effective intelligence agency in the world when it came to suppressing unrest. Simon Wiesenthal, a famous Holocaust survivor and Nazi hunter, went so far as to claim that the Stasi were worse than the Gestapo when it came to the oppression of their own people. The Gestapo had 40,000 officials watching a country of 80 million, while the Stasi employed 102,000 to control only 17 million. At its height, they employed 100,000 full-time employees and around 200,000 informants. But that's just the regular informants. Millions more people at some point or another provided information to the Stasi. If you take into account these one-offs, the Stasi network was unparalleled. To put it in perspective, the Soviet KGB had around one agent per 6,000 citizens. The Gestapo, one agent per 2,000. The full-time Stasi had around one agent per 166 citizens. When occasional informers are added, it may have been as high as one informer per six or seven people in the country. Or, it would not be unreasonable to assume that there was at least one Stasi informer present in any party of 10 or 12 dinner guests. I'm not trying to be funny, but that is actually insane, especially given that it was East Germany and very few people even wanted to be there in the first place. All major plants and factories had a full-time Stasi officer assigned to them. All apartment buildings had a designated informer, whose job was to keep track of everything happening in the building and anyone who might stay or visit. Schools and hospitals were all also infiltrated. If not enough informants could be found, the Stasi would often simply blackmail or threaten a possible recruit into taking on the role. Over the course of the Stasi's existence, around a quarter of a million people were imprisoned by them. These were purely political prisoners and had no bearing on the regular police force or 1 in 68 East Germans were political prisoners of the Stasi. In the early years, many of these prisoners were housed in repurposed Nazi prison camps. Crimes that could get you sent to these places including trying to cross the border, supporting West German political parties, and consuming Western media. It wasn't just political control either that encouraged the Stasi to keep such a close watch on the population. From the 1960s all the way to the dissolution of East Germany, the Stasi engaged in what was politely called prisoner transfer for what was more realistically human trafficking, or hostage taking if you prefer. In return for goods or cash payments from the West German government, the Stasi secretly traded political prisoners to the West. This provided incentive to keep as many prisoners as possible and keep sentencing harsh. This operation was kept highly secret on both sides of the border for obvious reasons, but it became known after reunification. Around 30,000 people were traded in this way for payments from the West, and it helped keep the ailing East German economy afloat for decades. Despite the massive levels of repression, defection remained common throughout the entire existence of the country. People from every class and job defected to the West. Here's footage of a border guard defecting by seeing his chance and quickly running across the border in Berlin. Most East Germans obtained official travel permits to go West and simply never returned, or entered a neutral country before heading West. 
Whatever the method, around 4 million people defected from East Germany between its founding and dissolution. Defections occurred at all levels of society as well. Professor Hermann Kastner, the deputy prime minister, was a Western informant and himself fled to the West. The Eastern economy was state-planned and state-owned, and actually did remarkably well given the circumstances it existed in. It was by far the strongest economy of the Eastern Bloc outside the Soviet Union, despite its early stripping. That said, living standards consistently lagged behind the West in most important areas. As with all countries in the 20th century, the economy changed dramatically over the course of the decades. In the late 1940s, under Olbricht, the economy followed a Stalinist model. Industries were taken under government control and the economy was centrally planned. Large agricultural estates were broken up and given to collectives. However, this didn't work particularly well. Nationalization and high quotas and a border that was still open with the West contributed to a mass exodus to West Germany. On the 16th of June 1953, an increase in quotas mixed with higher taxes, lower wages and a massive increase in the cost of living led to East Germany's first major revolt. Workers all across the country took to the streets to protest the increased quotas. What had initially simply been a rejection of the increased quotas quickly spiraled into something more. Many of the protesters began calling for free elections and reunification, being able to see the higher living standards of the West. More than a million workers protested, and fearing for stability, the GDR authorities called upon Soviet troops to put down the protests. Tanks rolled through Germany again, and local German forces opened fire on protesters. The disorganized revolt was quickly crushed. It had become clear, however, that a much firmer hand would be needed to keep control over the country. Armed guards were kept in all industrial areas from this point onwards. The date of this protest was also made an annual holiday in West Germany, seemingly out of spite. From this point onwards, though, things improved. The government abandoned sudden large-scale reforms and focused more on consumer goods to help placate the people. Once Honecker took over in 71, the economy came under even greater central control and slowly began to stagnate. This was made worse by a sizable and growing black market that people often turned to for goods, further weakening faith in the command economy. By the end of the 1980s, the East German economy had stalled, but hadn't collapsed completely as was the case in other Eastern Bloc countries. Exports to the West continued to be profitable and some global trade was still occurring. The East Germans, while still behind their Western counterparts, were living relatively comfortably, apart from the obvious political repression. This was supplemented by effective government subsidies. Rent was kept low through government construction of housing and subsidizing rents, and childcare was free for all working families as part of the actually fairly robust East German education system, which included both trade and academic courses. Generous maternity leave was also readily available to new parents. These were all good ideas that worked well to both improve standards of living and keep people productive. Given the joint cost of living and demographic issues currently facing the developed world, they might be worth revisiting. I'm as critical of East Germany as anyone, but I won't turn my nose up at good ideas just because they come from behind the Iron Curtain. The flag of the GDR was based on the traditional colors of German democracy and revolution. Gold, black, and red. The same flag that Germany uses today. It was initially simply these three colors in a bar, which lasted from 49 to 59, but from 59 to 90, the flag was changed to the one you probably think of, to involve more communist iconography. In the center was a hammer and compass surrounded by a wreath of corn. This symbolized the alliance between the working class, farmers, and academia in the country. It's fine. Like a lot of communist flags, I think the crest is a bit busy. If a child can't draw a one-to-one -one recreation from memory, I think that's a problem, but whatever. As for the national anthem, this is where East Germany really shines. It's terrific. Titled Risen for Ruins, it was written by a poet in the ruins of Germany in 1949, and it's the perfect embodiment of everything East Germany wished it was. It's hopeful, it's socialist, it's about rebuilding the country to have a better future for the children. And most importantly of all, it's really nice to listen to. Good job there, GDR. You actually excelled at something. Unsurprisingly, spending 40 years under a communist regime had a massive impact on German culture that lasts to this day. This section is about some of the most dramatic impacts on German culture due to the GDR. With Germany in ruins after the war, much of the architectural heritage of the country was lost. Rather than simply rebuild what had been destroyed, with the trauma of the war, many people sought a clean break from their past. A stripped-down form of brutalist, socialist architecture found fertile grounds in the ruins of East Germany. With their sheer, concrete facades and uniformity, this East German architecture has been a defining symbol of the GDR. It also helped that these buildings were much cheaper to build than the more elaborately decorated traditional styles, and people desperately needed the houses. In that sense, the brutalist cities were a great success, rising from the ruins and housing millions in comfort. But it wasn't just practicality. 
It was genuinely a new style that achieved real popularity, and even to this day remained a part of German architecture and culture. Even buildings that had survived the war often had their decorations stripped away intentionally in a break with the past and to better fit in with their new socialist surroundings. Though much of the differences in urban design and style have disappeared over the last 30 years of reunification, the communist influence is still heavily felt in cities in the east of Germany. It seems incredible now that a country would so enthusiastically throw away the beautiful past of its architectural history, but there was genuine societal trauma at play. The old ways had failed Germany in two world wars, gotten tens of millions of people killed, and turned Germany into rubble. There was a desire for something completely new. Even if in hindsight, it's just plain ugly and depressing. You can justify its artistic merit with however many essays on the human condition you want, it's still not going to make it nice. I'm showing my architectural biases here, but it's my video, so suck eggs. Also visible was the impact on art. Socialist realism was heavily supported by the East German government, again as a break from the past. It was clean and stripped down, much like the architecture, invoking images of a utopian and egalitarian future, free from the decadence of the past. Socialist art and fascist art can actually be quite similar in this regard, but this was also a break from the West, which had begun to favour more abstract artwork. In emphasising the divide between East and West in culture, it was easier to maintain the divide in the States. Interestingly, the Americans also recognised this, and the CIA began heavily subsidising West German artists through grants, exhibitions and mass purchase of paintings. By emphasising abstract art and freedom, they were more able to make socialist realism look even more stylized, more rigid and more confined than it actually was. So yes, there was a time in the Cold War that the CIA was funding German abstract art as a means of countering the Soviets. The Cold War was odd a lot of the time. The duration of socialist rule left a mark in other aspects of culture as well, most notable in religion. Today, the religious divide between Eastern and Western Germany is one of the most striking features of East Germany's legacy. In the 40 years of communist rule, church membership among East Germans dropped from 90% to under 30%. Meanwhile, in Western Germany, church membership kept steady at around 80% until the end of the 1990s. That doesn't mean that people were what you might call devout Christians who regularly attended religious ceremonies, but almost everyone had some connection to a church, however tenuous. Even today, more than half of East Germans identify strongly as atheists. This was part of a concerted effort by the communist government to separate people from their religious beliefs, even introducing an atheist confirmation ceremony that remains popular to this day. In the 2020s, about half of Germans overall belonged to a Christian faith, with a quarter or so identifying as atheist. But this number is, even today, dramatically weighted towards the East. Looking at religious maps of Germany is actually striking in how clearly defined the borders between Eastern atheism and Western religion are, and it remains one of the lingering effects of communist rule. With Germany jumping between a fascist state devoted to destroying communism right into a communist state, you might be wondering how popular communism actually was among the East Germans. I wish I could tell you. Unfortunately for us, opinion polls weren't exactly taken in the GDR, and due to Stasi surveillance, it was impossible even for those who opposed communism to speak up. But we can make a few assumptions. Given how quickly it all fell apart at the end, we can pretty safely assume it never quite won the hearts of the people. At best, it reduced them to a state of apathy. The nostalgia often felt for East Germany doesn't centre around a communist economy so much as a sense of community and striving towards something greater. Coming right after the Second World War, ex-Nazis and Nazism unsurprisingly played a major role in East German politics, with almost everyone of importance in Germany prior to East Germany's creation involved in the Nazi regime. Finding Germans with appropriate experience and qualifications was difficult, so instead the higher ranked a person was in the Nazi government, the more likely the prosecution was. The lower administrators and army officials were largely returned to their positions, regardless of crimes they may have committed. Ex-Nazis remained at least a double-digit percentage of all German officials throughout the country's history. The reason for this was simple. The Nazis were reliable and actually fairly easy to control. The integration of former National Socialists should by no means be mistaken for generosity, ideological unawareness, or a random failure in an otherwise insistent purge. The underlying arrangement of mutual silence and control implies a rather immoral clientelism, or plain blackmail. In other words, it was necessary for the function of the state to employ ex-Nazis, but their roles were never forgotten. If it became politically expedient to persecute or unofficial acted out of line, their former Nazi connections could easily be rediscovered and prosecutions could take place. In this way, making die-hard communists out of former fascists was pretty easy. You just threatened to arrest them if they didn't comply. Simple. Remarkably, this situation lasted about all the way to the end of the GDR. 
It's very difficult to get exact figures for the number of ex-Nazis in the East German government, but suffice it to say, it was a lot, and the communist government was well aware of this. East Germany initially had a terrible time getting international recognition. The West Germans refused until 1969 to have diplomatic relations with any country that recognized the GDR. As West Germany was frankly the far more important Germany, this essentially cut the GDR off from any country that wasn't part of the Warsaw Pact. The United States initially declared in 1949 that GDR was without any legal validity, and that the United States would continue in its efforts to restore a truly free and democratic Germany. Relations were finally established in 1974, but they were never friendly. From this point onwards, the East was at least recognized as an entity, but was forever tied at the hip to the Soviet Union. While West Germany flatly refused to recognize East German independence ever, the East German constitution actually recognized the alliance with the Soviet Union as an essential component of East Germany itself. This article naturally limited East Germany's diplomatic options quite a bit. Though given that the SED was the only ruling party, it didn't practically make all that much difference. The Soviets exercised considerable control of the GDR and it effectively operated as a satellite state. Though it wasn't without options to resist, if the Soviets wanted something, they were more or less going to get it. Occasionally this caused problems, like when Dr. Eric Abel, Chairman of the State Planning Commission and Deputy Chairman of the Council of Ministers, chose to shoot himself in 1965 rather than sign an unfair trade treaty. Militarily, East Germany formed the strongest force in the Warsaw Pact outside the Soviet Union itself. Though its military was initially founded as a volunteer force that sprung out of the German police, conscription was quickly introduced, and it ballooned into a considerable power. Being the most reliable Allied force, the East Germans were able to leverage their power to exercise slightly more independence from the Soviet Union than the other satellite states. In the last decade of Soviet Europe, this was important. This was mostly fine in the case of East Germany, until Gorbachev came to power, and the communist culture divide appeared. While in the Soviet Union, Gorbachev's reforms encouraged a new era of openness, an end to censorship and political repression, East Germany was run by hardliners until the end. In the 1980s, this put it in a strange position within the Warsaw Pact. While the Soviet Union was preaching reform, the GDR cracked down as harshly as ever. This could be seen most clearly in Poland. While the Solidarity Movement undermined the Polish dictatorship, Moscow preached moderation. The East Germans, however, showed that Stasi operations began in Poland to undermine these groups without even informing the Polish themselves. Meanwhile, in government, high-ups in the GDR advocated military intervention to secure communist rule, as had been done in Hungary decades earlier. This time, it was the Soviets that refused to participate. Things got so bad that by the end of the 1980s, even some Soviet media was being censored for being overly critical of communism. In 1989, as part of the general dissolution of the Eastern Bloc, Hungary opened its borders with Austria, and thousands of East Germans began flowing through to get to the West. Despite efforts from the government to stop the exodus, the tension in the country after decades of oppression was too much. Hundreds of thousands of people began protesting in Berlin, while the fleeing East Germans began causing disruptions in neighboring communist countries. Eventually within the government, a decision was made to allow trips to West Germany through approved border crossings. It's perhaps fitting that the end of East Germany came from a bureaucratic era as much as anything else. The system that sustained it finally made a mistake that couldn't be covered up and collapsed the country overnight. On the 9th of November 1989, SED official Gunter Schabowski was giving a press conference to assembled journalists, discussing the new rules for crossing the border. Shortly beforehand, someone had passed him a note with the new rules, announcing the border could be crossed. This was intended to be a political move, purely to stem the flow of Germans trying to escape through the Eastern Bloc. It was meant to be rolled out slowly, in a way that could control the number of people leaving and minimize disruption. None of this had been explained to Schabowski, however, and he was put on stage, he announced the change rules in the open borders, and when the journalist asked when they would take effect, he replied, On live television broadcast across all of East Germany, the spokesman for the SED announced that the borders were open. This absolutely wasn't what had been intended, but the damage was done. Hundreds of thousands of people flocked to the border in Berlin, and the guards, without orders and seeing the mass of people now ready to get out by any means necessary, opened the border themselves. Suddenly, the wall was coming down. The unbreakable power of the state was broken. The people of Berlin surged across the border. The army stood down without orders. David Hasselhoff was there for some reason and gave a spontaneous performance on top of the wall. People climbed all over the concrete barrier and smashed it with hammers. My high school history teacher once showed us a piece she took as a souvenir. The fall of the Berlin Wall wasn't quite the end of East Germany, but you could see it in the distance. 
There really wasn't any coming back from this with the Eastern Bloc collapsing around it and the population now in open defiance. With the surge in unrest, the SED modified the constitution to allow non-communists to take power and held an election in the March of 1990. This was the last East German election and its only free and fair one. A new democratic government was formed and on the 23rd of August 1990, East Germany voted itself out of existence, becoming part of the Federal Republic, bringing us to the modern German state. In public, the reunification of Germany was a cause for celebration. In private, however, there was considerable concern in Europe that a new Germany would come to dominate the continent just as the old one had. Thatcher and Mitterrand were vocally opposed to the reunification, though accepted there was little they could do to stop it. Support was basically mixed outside Germany, but with the backing of the United States and the overwhelming consensus among Germans being reunification, the process couldn't be stopped. On the whole though, now that it's happened, it's really only weirdos and die-hard communists that regret the loss of the GDR. Genuinely regret, not just occasionally think, man, the Trabant was fun. Modern Germany has in many ways become the linchpin of the European community and peace rather than a threat to it. For the Zoomers like me, a unified Germany goes without saying. But at the time, it was shocking to most people, including the Germans themselves, that reunification went so quickly and so well. It's been called the German miracle, because when you really stop and think about it, the fact that East Germany could fall apart and be absorbed into the West in around a year, basically without a hitch, is incredible. One of the really extraordinary achievements of modern Europe. Germany today is the largest economy in Europe, has a leading role in the European Union, enjoys a stable democracy and human rights, and has a standard of living above most of the world. Aside from issues that face really the entire world, just about everywhere on earth can find a reason to be envious of Germany. That said, it's not perfect and there are still issues that stem from last century's division. The eastern half of the country remains to this day poorer than the west. A solid wealth divide is visible, and despite Germany now being unified, there's still a small exodus of people going east to west. Additionally, political extremism remains more prevalent in the East, with both far-left and far-right groups finding their electoral success largely in this region, possibly because of the wealth gap fueling radicalization. Generally, Eastern infrastructure was of a worse quality than the West, and it took massive investment over decades just to bring the East up to Western standards. But broadly speaking, the divide is shrinking, and the legacy of the Cold War is fading into the past, as fewer and fewer people even remember the GDR, and even fewer than that remember it fondly. Egon Krenz, the East German leader I talked about earlier, isn't one of those people. He called the fall of the Berlin Wall the worst night of my life. Krenz remains a committed communist who mourns the loss of East Germany. He also remains a Russophile that opposes aid to Ukraine, NATO and sanctions against Russia, and has called China a beacon of hope. So there is definitely a political legacy still alive in some areas, it's just not mainstream. And that's the story of the German Democratic Republic. Thanks for watching. You done good, Hasselhoff.